another way of thinking about this notion that we are adumbrations of larger historical epochs is the aphorism, Rome falls nine times an hour. This is the idea, and it does. I mean, I always notice it. it it's just there. We are very state-bounded in our self-observations. And we only tend to value what is relevant to profane existence and communication. So the fact that as you sweep the house, you notice Rome falling nine times an hour, there's not much to say about it. It's just, I think, weird things. I wonder if everybody thinks weird things. I think the answer is yes. And that not only does Rome fall nine times an hour, but the Celts move out of Spain and into England nine times an hour, and so forth. That really, the present is a, an interference pattern caused by epochs in the past um, coming together to create a certain particular situation. So what has been happening since 1945, since the dawn moment over Hiroshima, is that the entire history of the universe is being recapitulated. Uh, now, it has many cycle levels of cyclic expression. On one level, the first land animals have yet to appear. We are truly in the inchoate darkness. On the level of the 4,306 year cycle, we are deep in the dark ages. And on the basis of that, in the barbarians, the time when the barbarian hordes poured into Europe, the sacking of Eleusis and all that, I see uh, punk culture as the harmonic response to the fact of this happening. On the basis of it, I would predict that in the late 80s, the uh, new wave punk phenomenon will give way to an almost gothic religious sensibility, which will be, in fact, a recapitulation of the early Middle Ages and uh, feminine... Well, no, no. <laughs> in the Mariological cults that found their expression at Chart and places like that in the early 90s, we will have a, 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 a feminist revival which will be slightly wrong-headed because it will make those same mistakes that those Gothic people made. We will not even reach the threshold of the Industrial Revolution until about 23. 2003. So you see, the notion of us sitting around making sense of things is quite preposterous. I mean, we are still waiting for Newton, let alone for Maxwell and Einstein. We are all, not prehistory, except on the highest level. Um, so this intensification will occur. Now, uh, what is it leading to? This is the part, you know, Christianity insists that the world will end and that uh, it will just roll up like a scroll and uh, the triumphant Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, why do they believe that? Obviously, apocalypse haunts history like a ghost in the kind of cosmology I'm defining, there must be anticipations of it. The death of every human being is an anticipation of the apocalypse. The collapse of every empire, the, uh, any cessation is a part of the sensation. It is the archetype of the ending. So this knitting together this compactification of uh, novelty and connectedness, which is emanating out from the most densely compactified and connected thing in nature, which is the human cortex. This is an interesting thing. We've worked so hard to move ourselves out of the center of the mandala 
thing, but the fact of the matter is the most complex object in nature is the human brain. Curious. Uh, this knitting together that is emanating from the human brain is accelerating at such a rate that we are rapidly going to become unrecognizable to ourselves. The, the end point which I have come to feel is correct is the end point 67 years 104.5 days after the Hiroshima blast. And that would be dawn of the 16th day of November in 2012. Mm. Now I had worked all this out and the thin thread on which I am here in a conference devoted to the Mayans is that after I had worked all this out I discovered that the long count of the Mayan, the calendar of which you have heard so much contains 13 Bakhtuns. Now, the emergence of, uh, of uh, Mayan civilization as we currently understand it is around Bak late in Bakhtun 6. And the complete collapse of the Mayan is uh, in around the middle of Bakhtun 11. But their whole calendar was generated from the end of Bakhtun 13, there is no Bakhtun 14. They said, that's it. That's the end. The end of Bakhtun 13 is the winter solstice of 2012. 34 days later than the date I reached through this series of involvements with the I Ching. But then I discovered there's what's called the Thompson Correction. The Thompson Correction is a different reading on certain calendrical material which would locate the end of Bakhtun 13 only four days after the date that I had chosen. So the question seemed to me then, what is it about psilocybin mushrooms that <laughs> a civilization in Mesoamerica in the 11, in the 8th and 9th century and an individual in California in the 20th century would both do an elaborate series of mathematical contortions, different mathematical contortions, reach the same point in time. What is happening there? And uh, we were talking last night about how um, how the uh, my my little story about what happened to the Mayans, to the Maya, and Peter pretty much agreed was around 970 and probably at Copan, which was the Alexandria of the Mayan world. It's where the mathematics and this, you know, these things were brought to their peak. They figured it out. They figured it out, and they ended the long count. It was obviously ended as a uh, an order. It took about 20 years to emanate out from Copan and to reach the most remote Mayan centers, Quiragua and uh, Palenque and so forth. But within 30 years, the long count had been ended, the stela had been pushed over face down in the grass, the cities emptied, and the Maya returned to being primitive agricultural pastoralists. I think it was because they, they figured it out. They saw what was coming. And uh, once you have figured it out, the curious thing about this notion I'm propounding is that it carries no obligation. It is a way of making you free by admitting you are more deterministically bound than you ever dreamed. You know, you had to go into Hadrian's hamburger joint. It was settled when Hadrian invaded Scotland that you had to go into that hamburger joint. And so we are, we are bearing an unnecessary burden of guilt and responsibility. We are living in a cosmos, not a chaos. The universe is doing what it wants to do. It is calling forth 
the kind of novelty that it wants to call forth. The fact that we cannot understand its purpose is our problem, you know? And we are not its victims. The, in these short epochs, what is happening is something that I think can only be understood by um, having recourse to the metaphors of alchemy. Alchemy and modern science, these are anticipations of taking control of energy, of binding, as James Joyce says, all space in a nutshell. It's where what the concrescence is, is the flowing together of everything in a higher spatial dimension. We mentioned last night uh, the saying in the I Ching, if this sacrifice is correct, the person who correctly understands this sacrifice can hold the universe in the palm of their hand like a spinning marble. This is absolutely true. It's a statement of physics. It is not a metaphor, an analogy, or anything else. It is that reality is being knitted together into a spinning marble. Everything but that spinning marble is an illusion. Um, it has many reflections in linear history, which is like the shadow cast into three-dimensional space-time by this higher dimensional reality. It is the telos at the end of time. Uh, its modern manifestation is the flying saucer. The flying saucer haunts time like a ghost. It only exists at the end of the historical process, yet it is somehow co-present, spread throughout the historical process. It is... Um, the proof that the apocalyptic moment exists. Another metaphor for this concrescence, this spinning marble, is uh, the Holy Grail or the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone is an object which is made out of mind. It has, it's called, the one gloss on it was, it was called the Sophic Hydrolith. The uh, the water thought stone. It is something which has the quality of mind and matter. And this is what the human function is, I think, is through technos to eliminate the distinction between mind and matter, to free us into the imagination. That's where we're going when the novelty wave runs to zero and we are released into this trans-historical space, it is the imagination. And it will not be miraculous. It will be created by us, through us, through a number of uh, disciplines, technologies, ideas, and innate abilities that we cannot currently hope to do more than glimpse because we are so far back in the historical continuum from where this thing is going to happen in 2012. So basically, uh, this is a funny explanation of almost everything. <laughs> they say when you, when you create a funny explanation of almost everything, you have to be careful that you don't unexplain a whole bunch of things and I don't think this unexplains too much because it is uh, it is not an extension of a current paradigm in other words it is not physics it says nothing about particle physics or quantum mechanics or anything that it talks about time which is not matter we have been obsessed with matter for millennia a thought of time is just something passing by. You couldn't really get a handle on it. But uh, maturity will mean getting a handle on it. And everything I've said about the historical process and how puzzling it is, is true in our own lives. For instance, you may have noticed that every day is sort of like every other day. And yet, every day is different. 
this is this fractal nature of things working and there are days of great advance but they are embedded in this larger matrix of a pretty steady state situation I studied with Wes Churchman who was a futurist and he used to like to say that most of the future is already present in the present and uh, it's this kind of idea so um, what I was able to do with this I Ching, I Ching wave and what I offer as the uh, proof or at least the uh, the place where pressure should be put on the theory if we want to falsify it is uh, we wrote a computer program which very rapidly sorts through the wave on many levels and will draw the graph of novelty for any point in time and it will draw it on different scales we can like say you were interested in uh, the French Revolution 1789 we can throw a picture up on the screen which shows you 1788, 89, and 90. And you can then ask yourself, does this line fulfill my intuition of how a novelty curve descriptive of the French Revolution should look? But suppose you're a specialist, you're interested only in the assassination of Marat okay then we can look at the 19 days in 1789 surrounding his assassination on the 20th of July and so forth but where it is really interesting is in application to our own lives and there then you have a personal body of information that you can try against the wave to see if in fact it fits your intuition of how your life should work there are a couple of people here who have counseled with me one on one where we've actually looked at their life and then on into the future it goes right on into the future to 2012 and of course 2012 is just my choice after a lot of reflection I chose that as the apocalyptic zero date the program is set up so early in the program you can enter any apocalyptic zero date and then you search for best fit and the way I use it is I like to go to the scale where there are 19 years on the screen or I mean three years on the screen or even 200 years on the screen and then I'll go way back and then it has a continue function and I just fly over the mountains of time and when I see a steep valley I dive into it and blow up the fractal landscape and then the program has a function called near which is a historical data file and you can just hit a button and it will tell you um, Ascension of Ataxerxes, 514 <laughs> B.C. There it is. Look, uh, his son was an idiot, and but then he came on, and the wave it fits, it works. This is it. It's all clear, and uh, so it's a way of modeling history. And if I could contort it into a video game, my life would be much easier. <laughs>